Today we're going to talk about a panel method. Last time we were talking about thin air fuel theory and while uh, it led to some very powerful insights, namely lift curve slope, location of aerodynamic center of the quarter cord, and of course uh, lift curve slope of two pi. Uh, the method itself has some uh, strong limitations, particularly near the leading edge. We can get uh, some force coefficients reasonably well for lift and pitching moment, but the assumption of a small disturbance is really poor one, particularly near the leading edge. So we're gonna look at panel methods. These are still widely used in aerodynamics, very useful within the assumptions of potential flow theory, but we don't have to limit ourselves to small disturbances. Uh, let me share the screen here. Um, let's say that we're gonna discuss a simpler panel method. Um, these exist in three dimensions. We're only going to use a 2D version. And we're going to use the first sort of practical panel method. It's called the Hess-Smith panel method. Uh, it has some simplifications compared to what you might use in, say, XFOIL, for example. But the concepts are, are very much the same. So we're going to go through this in detail. It's going to build off things that we've already seen. First of all, here's a formulation, we, the same kind of thing we did in, in, in uh, thin air flow theory, where we divided up our potential into a contribution from the free stream, from the sources, and from the vortices. And these are the same expressions we saw before. This time though, instead of putting things on the chord line, we're going to distribute sources and vortices along the actual surface of the body. Um, and we're going to enforce the boundary conditions at the body, so we won't have to make those thin airflow approximations. Again, this automatically satisfies Laplace's equation, automatically satisfies the far field boundary conditions. So we just need to worry about two things. One is flow tangency at boundary condition, and then the cut of condition that we discussed last time. Just by way of nomenclature, in the Hess Smith panel method, we're going to discretize our geometry into linear panels. So you can see these linear segments is most easily seen here at the leading edge where this is obviously too coarse of a description, but we can see how there's a linear uh, variation. Each one of these things we call a panel in 3D. Um, you know, this could be a plate. They don't necessarily have to be flat. We can have curved panels as well, but flat panels are pretty common. And uh, by convention, we're gonna start our numbering of panels with a right here on the trailing edge on the lower surface going one, two, three, working our way around the back towards the front. And this will be N minus one and then finally N. So we'll have N panels. With that formulation, our free stream is exactly the same as we just saw, cosine alpha X plus sine alpha Y, okay? But now the integral over the body is going to uh, be changed into a summation over each panel, and then integration occurs only on each panel. So in other words, instead of integrating over the entire airfoil, right, we just have to integrate over one panel and then sum up across each panel. So we'll sum over, oops, I equals one then. And then the integral just occurs over, say, panel, panel I. <clears throat> And then I'm going to write these two things. Notice they're both an integral over ds. So I'll just combine this into one integral. Uh, this is going to be a, um, and I guess I could pull one over two pi out here. This is going to be q of s times the natural log of r minus gamma times or gamma of s times theta ds. <clears throat> okay, so I would need to perform that integration along each panel. Now, different panel methods are going to assume different things about how these sources and vorticity is distributed on the, along each panel. In the Hess-Smith method, we assume that the source strength is constant on each panel. It's a different constant on each panel, so the source strength is different from panel one to panel two, but on a given panel, it's a constant. So we can replace this Q of S with just QI, right, because it's a constant for panel I. Uh, similarly, gamma we are going to not make it a distribution, but also rather a constant on a given panel. And in fact, it's going to be the same constant on every panel. The motivation for that is that 
the way we're going to formulate this is going to give us n plus one equations. So the n equations for flow tangency. So at each panel, we'll define a control point, one on every panel that will enforce flow tangency. So that'll give us n equations, right? One flow tangency equation at each panel. And then our cut a condition will add one more uh, equation. So that's n plus one equations. Well, for these source strengths, that's already n unknowns, right? One source strength at each panel. So we can only have one more unknown and that's gonna be the this uh, vorticity or the uh, uh, vortex strength per unit length gamma. That'll give us one unknown. Okay, so we can't have one in each panel. Uh, there are other ways we could choose this, right? There are other options. We could actually have the vorticity vary at each panel and have a constant source strength, or you could have linearly or quadratically or, or you know, other ways that these uh, uh, strengths could vary in different shape panels, but this is what we use in the Hess Smith. So we have n plus one equations, n plus one unknowns. These you could think of as being used to, they're, they're all gonna satisfy simultaneously, but uh, uh, we have the n equations for low tangency and then one sort of circulation that we'll set to make sure we satisfy cut a condition uh, accounting for these as well. All right, so I already talked briefly about these control points, but we have to decide where they're gonna be. So we're gonna satisfy our boundary conditions and, and cut a condition uh, on these panels. And we're gonna do that at the midpoint of each panel. We can't use the endpoints of the panel because there are singularities. Um, we get infinite velocity at the end, so we'll choose the midpoint of the panel. Um, so we'll satisfy flow tangency at each one, and the normal direction is going to be pointing out. So we want the velocity along this direction to be zero. So the normal component of the velocity is zero at each panel. The cut of condition, remember that we want the trailing edge or the, tr the tangential velocity to be zero at the trailing edge. Uh, but we have to satisfy at the midpoint of the panel so we can see it's actually somewhat inboard. It's not actually at the trailing edge. This turns out to be a fortuitous uh, thing, even though this is approximation because of our discretization. It's actually a better match to the physical reality because the actual flow doesn't actually generally stay attached all the way to the trailing edge. There's going to be some small amount of separation. So applying the boundary condition uh, a tiny bit inboard actually does a better job compared to uh, experimental data. All right, so we've already discretized, so we just now need to consider some generic panel I. Um, and we our paneling has a direction. It goes from I to I plus one. And so by the way, we've defined it. Uh, this is going to be our tangential direction, right? Because we are just going to traverse. So tangential is going to go this way. And as we come back around, it's going to go this way. And the normal direction by convention always points outward. So if we notice that this is say I and this is I plus one, and this is normal. Uh, and as we come around, this is I and I plus one. So this is be our surface normal. In both cases, we'll see, we can see that our surface normal would have to point this direction, right? Not downward, but upward, just based on our convention of going outward. So uh, we're gonna be given some geometry. So we know our X and Y locations. Let's, let's define a coordinate system. Let's say this is X and this is Y. So we know our airflow coordinate at this point and this point because we're given the geometry. So we can define a bunch of things that we're gonna need. For example, we're gonna use the sine and cosine of the angle. And we don't necessarily need to save the angle directly. We don't actually ever need theta, but we only need sine of theta and cosine of theta. So sine of theta is gonna be given by uh, this height over this length. So that would be, um, yi plus one minus yi over li. And then the cosine, of course, then would be the delta x over the length. And of course, the length we could get uh, from Pythagorean theorem, right? It's be delta x squared plus delta y squared square rooted. The tangential uh, vector then is going to be cosine of theta in the x plus sine of theta in the y. Oops, let's write that out. And then the normal component is in this direction. So that's in the minus x. So that's a minus sine theta in the x plus cosine theta in the y. Okay. The other thing we're going to need is our control points. Those are simple enough. Remember, we said we're going to put our control point 
just right here at the center of the panel. So we'll label that as a bar. The control point in the X is just gonna be the average X value of my endpoints. Similarly for Y. And then when, I, when we write UI, what we really mean is we're gonna evaluate the velocity at these control points and similarly for V, right? So it's my velocity evaluated at the midpoint of the panel. All right, so these are just a few, few preliminaries that we are gonna need. Okay, so now let's get to our boundary conditions. We already mentioned these, but we now need a formula for them. Flow tangency, <clears throat> we could derive a number of ways. Easy way is to say that the normal velocity needs to be zero, or we could do what we did with thin air flow last time and say the local slope of the geometry dy dx, which in this case is a tangent of theta, would have to be equal to v over u. But let's do the flow tangent this, this form since we just derived what the vector n hat, and we know our velocity vector is ux hat plus vy hat, so that's just a simple dot product to take, right? u times minus sine theta plus v times cos theta has to equal zero. So that's minus ui sine theta i plus vi cos theta i equals zero. So that's something we have to just enforce on all i panels. Now the cutting condition, recall, is that at the trailing edge, the tangential velocity on the upper surface and the tangential velocity on the lower surface should be equal. But in our case, remember that we define tangential going around this way. So it's going this way. So we actually uh, need to set VT1. Remember, one is going to be this first panel. Has to be opposite of VTN, right? Uh, we could put the minus sign on either one. It doesn't really matter. Right, maybe it makes more sense to us to say this way, right? That VT1 is going to the left, but we really want it to go to the right to compare with the one on, on the top. Okay, so this is just comparing only the first and last panel. And again, the one in the end just becomes from our convention that that's just how we decided to number panels, one and n here at the end. So to get the tangential component, same thing, do a dot product of the velocity against this one. So we're just gonna get, uh, let's see, u1, cos theta one plus v1 sine theta one equals un cos theta n plus vn sine theta n. So again, this is n equations on each panel. This is one equation, right? Uh, and I forgot a minus sign. I need to put a minus sign on one of them. It doesn't really matter which one, so let's just stick it here. just because I think that's what I did in my notes. Okay, so now what we need to do is to be able to calculate um, the influence of one panel on another. Because remember, we said we want the velocity at a midpoint, but the velocity at a midpoint is a sum of the contributions from every other panel. So in other words, this panel has a bunch of sources on it, and those sources exert some velocity on this panel. And so does this panel, this panel, this panel. So to get the velocity, at this point, I need to sum up the contribution from every single panel. So to do that, I just need to do it for one arbitrary panel and then do a loop, right? Summing across each one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute uh, the X component velocity, so that's U, for a source distribution, that's what this S means, at panel I induced by the sources at panel J. You don't have to really remember that too much, but just wanna explain what those are. So we've got sources at J, they're influencing some other panel, which we call I. All right, now we've actually done basically this already. If you remember with thin airflow theory, we had a distribution of sources along the chord line and we derived an expression just based on knowing what, how point vortex worked on how those point sources, or those point sources rather, the velocity they would create at some other arbitrary point X, Y. Right, so just to draw that, we had sources, right? There were sources along this panel. And this was my um, X and this was Y. And then I could calculate the velocity UV at some arbitrary point. Now, in our case, we have almost the same thing, except for our panel here is in some arbitrary orientation, right? It's not necessarily aligned with the, the X axis like it was before. So we can still reuse those same equations. We just have to do it in this rotated coordinate system. So in this rotated coordinate system, which we'll call X prime and Y prime, 
Now the distance to the point we want to evaluate is now going to be x prime and y prime. These are the expressions. So at this point here, right, this point here, I can get my velocities u star and v star. And notice that they're also rotated relative to my coordinate system. So I can calculate my velocity anywhere, uh, but it's just going to be this rotate system and I'm measuring x and y along the panel. So these are the formulas we saw before, right? These are the same ones we did before, except for uh, we're using x stars and, and x stars and y stars instead of x's and y's. And one more thing that's easier in this case is that before we had some q of s inside of here, right? But in our case, since Q is constant on each panel, that was the choice we made with the Hess Smith panel method, that the source strength is constant, then we can pull it out of the integral. So we just have this QJ, right? So that's the source strength on this panel J. That's nice because now since that Q of S, which was some unknown distribution went out, the rest of this we're integrating just over S, X and Y here are just variables. They're just constants as far as integration is concerned. You can actually integrate this analytically I do that in the book. I'm not going to repeat the details here. It's it's not that hard, but it's a little more. Well, it's out, you know, not uh, terribly important that I go through that here. So I'm just going to write down the result. This one ends up being a natural log of the square root of x star minus l j squared plus y star squared divided by square root of x star squared plus y star squared. And then this bottom one, we can also integrate analytically. We have the qj over two pi, and then the integral becomes the arc tangent of x star over y star. And then we subtract uh, x star minus lj over y star. Okay, so that's just the result of those integrations. It was a little bit lengthy, but the clever part is that if we look at the geometry, we can actually kind of simplify, we can simplify these expressions and make uh, this is a little easier to evaluate. So let's draw that. This is um, some arbitrary panel J, right? And it starts at node J, goes to node J plus one. And remember, we're evaluating the velocity at some other panel, at the center of some other panel, I, right? That was this figure here, right, where we go from j to j plus one and we're evaluating the center of some other panel, i, okay? And this is just a repeat of those same equations that I just wrote down, just writing them down for convenience again. And what we wanna do is to see if we can relate or simplify some of these things based on the geometry. So if we look at this, we know, first of all, remember what x star and y star are, they're just the distance from j, right? That's the start of our sources to the point at which we're evaluating uh, the velocity at. So this distance here is x star, and then this distance here is y star, right? So the arc tangent of, well, let's just start actually with the top one. This is the square root of x star squared plus y star squared. That's this distance squared plus this distance squared square rooted. That is this distance here. So let's write that. We're going to call that Rij. So this term here is just Rij. It's the distance from node J to the center of panel I. Okay. Similarly for the top, notice that that one is x star minus L squared, which is this distance squared plus the y star squared. This distance squared plus this distance squared square rooted is this one right here. So we'll call that Rij plus one because we're going from the center of I to no j plus one. Okay, so this numerator here is just r r i j plus one. That's great. So let's now look at the bottom. Uh, see if we can simplify that. We've got the arc tangent of x star over y star. That's this is x star. This is y star. So the arc tangent of that, right? The tangent of this angle here is x star over y star. So the arc tangent is this angle here, which um, I'll just call that uh, alpha. So that this thing here is alpha. Um, this one, the tangent of x star minus L over y star is this angle. So the arc tangent is just the angle, uh, which let's call that um, this one, we'll call that uh, theta, let's say. So this is theta. Okay, and then one more simplification we can make 
Notice that this is now alpha minus theta. So it's really this angle here that we actually care about. So let's write that and we'll call that uh, beta ij. So this whole thing becomes beta ij. So beta ij we can see is the angle given by these two lines, right? From the center panel i to j and j plus one. So that's kind of a nice thing for a couple of reasons. One is I can write these formulas a lot shorter. This expression here now becomes minus qj over two pi times the log of, uh, let's see, rij plus one over rij, right? And then vsij star is just equal to qj over two pi times beta ij, and that's it. So first of all, I could write them simpler, but uh, the other nice thing here is that we can see that uh, our calculation is gonna be easier because we don't have to figure out um, X star, actually X stars and Y stars and Ls, we never have to use at all. All we need to know is that I've got some arbitrary panel and then I've got the other panel I'm evaluating at and I just need to get the two lengths and the angle between them and that's it, right? So again, to illustrate, as we go through the loop, we're just gonna have some panel J and I'm evaluating its influence at some other panel I. And so all I need to do is figure out, okay, I've got these two lines here. I need the lengths of those and I need that angle and that's it. So this is just geometry, not hard to do. Um, the R's are obviously uh, straightforward, just Pythagorean theorem. Uh, I'll talk briefly about beta. So computing the angle, Sometimes we can have, uh, it's not conceptually hard to do, but numerically there can be some things that, uh, that can trip you up. I'm going to have you, I'm going to refer you to the book to look at the equation, but I'll just note two things that can be helpful to use uh, what's called ATAN2 in most programming languages. It's just a, another implementation of the arctangent that always returns an angle that's between minus pi and pi. And actually it's a closed bracket on the pi side. Um, this, uh, the, the, so there's a formula in the book. It's a, a reliable way to do this, works in 3D, so you won't get any numerical issues. Just make sure you use a tan two. The other thing to do or to note is that if you are calculating the influence of the panel on itself, so this is J, this is J plus one, and I evaluate it on every single panel, but I also need to evaluate the contribution of the panel on itself. So here's I. Well, in that case, what's the angle that I should use? Right, so um, it's uh, if we just use the same a tan two formula, it will work. But the problem is that numerically, you can see this angle here, right? Is you know what's the angle between here and here? Well, it's either going to be depending on the angle, it's going to be something that's very close to pi or something that's very close to negative pi. Right, just depending on kind of my numerical error and if these things are not exactly lined up perfectly. Um, and so that's a problem is that if you get sometimes pi and sometimes minus pi, it's effectively changing your normal direction. So we want, uh, we're interested in the external flow. And so we want to make this consistent. We want it to actually be pi. So um, if, if i is equal to j, then you should just hard code it to be pi. Don't rely on the a tan two for just this uh, self-influence, just set it equal to pi. Okay, that's one thing that trips people up when they implement this and that will save you some grief. All right, uh, now we have to do this exact same thing, right, except for vortices. But if you recall from vortices, these two expressions look almost the same, except for we flop the, or we switch the numerators and then there's a minus sign on one of them. So we're not gonna go through that because it's the same. Uh, you would be surprised to see that these look almost identical, we just move one to the other. Um, and then there's a, a change in sign on one of them, right? So this one had a minus sign and now it doesn't. Okay, so you can go do the math in the book, but uh, the, you know, basically the same process. All right, uh, one more, or another thing we gotta do now, recall that what we did is we solved it in the frame of the panel and that gave us U star and V star. So we're in the rotated panel, but each panel is gonna have its own orientation so I need to rotate them all back to a common orientation so I can add them together. So I'm gonna just put them back into my global XY thing. And that's an easy thing to do, right? Because again, what we have is 
I'm at some arbitrary point here. Let's just actually it should be here, right? Where X star and Y star are as I've drawn it. I've got U star and V star, and I just need to rotate it to get U and V so that I can add everything up in a consistent way. Well, that's simple, right? Because this is theta, so this is just standard rotation. So U is going to be U star cos theta J minus V star sine theta J, and then V is going to be U star sine theta J plus V star cos theta J. And that'll allow, allow us to add them all up. All right. So now we've got all the pieces. We can put everything together. Um, here we go. So just as a reminder, we have flow tangency. That was the first condition we derived. Um, and so to get those U's, right? So U now is my free stream component. Plus, we just computed USIJ. That was the contribution from the sources at the ith location on the J panel. And I need to sum over all my J panels. So this gives me my velocity now at point I by adding up the contribution from every other, from all J panels, including uh, its own panel. And then I do the same thing for the vortices. Oops. U for the vortices and sum over all J panels. Okay. So, and then I do the same thing for V, right? It's going to be V sine alpha plus these things, which look more or less the same, right? You just change the U's with the V's. Okay, so we know how to do all those. We got them all, right? The U's uh, are functions of these U stars and the U stars, right, are functions of gammas and Q's, right? But you'll notice they are linearly with Q. So I'm actually gonna pull the Q's out and the gammas because these are my unknowns. So I'm gonna have my unknowns and then everything else I'm gonna lump into these terms, which we'll just call A. So if I was to write that out, um, this is not hard to do, but it's like, you know, I do it in the book, it's like four pages of math, but it's just simple algebra. What I get then is uh, I get the sum over J equals one to N of these coefficients, I'll call AIJ times QI. So AIJ is everything except for that. I just pulled it out. And then we're gonna call this one uh, N plus one for reasons we'll see in a minute, times gamma equals BI. Okay, so all I've done is I've just used these exact formulas, but I pulled out the Qs and the gammas because those are my unknowns. So everything that's left is just geometry and my free stream conditions. Uh, this is what they look like. If I were to, to go through that math and, and derive it a little more carefully, these are the expressions I get. So this is my IJ component. And you'll notice that it's just a function of those things that we already have, right? Those R's those betas we talked about, and then the theta is my local angle of those uh, panels. So all of this, all of these are just pure geometry. Once you give me the geometry, I can compute all of this beforehand. I just have to go through a loop, a double loop, right? And, and compute the influence of each panel and each, each other, and fill out uh, these entries. B also depends on the geometry, but primarily the free stream and the angle of attack, and just the local inclination of the panel. Okay. Uh, but I have one more equation that I need to put in. That's the cut of condition. It's the exact same process. This is the cut of condition. We already know the U's and the V's, so I plug all those in. What's going to happen is once I substitute them in, I will get something that looks like this. Uh, and we'll call these new coefficients n plus 1j, again, for reason we'll see in a minute. I'm just, again, pulling out my unknowns. Actually, that's a qj, sorry. And then n plus 1. N plus one is what we'll call it, times gamma equals B of N plus one. So again, it's just these same equations. I substituted all the stuff we had, pulled out the unknowns, and we get an equation that looks like this. And these are what those coefficients look like. Um, notice we compute this for a given J, but the sum is not over every panel. In this case, you just sum over panel one and panel N, because it's the first and last panel for the cut of conditions of this K. So in other words, you repeat this, where you put one here and a one here, a one here, one here, and then you add it to the same thing except for you put n there, n there, n there, n there, okay? Similarly here, this is a sum over all the j's, but the k sum is only for one and n, right? And just to explain, why do I see a sum here but not here? Well, the reason is 
uh, we could have left the sum here, but in this case, gamma was constant. So for example, assume Q was constant here. I could have pulled it out and then taken the sum of all those coefficients and called it a new one. That's what we did here because gamma was constant. Rather than keeping the sum here, we just do the sum beforehand and lump that all into this one big constant. All right, so what do we have? Well, now I've got these two equations that we just wrote out. This is flow tangency where we pulled out everything except from the unknown, unknowns. This is the cut of condition. Um, I can now write this in one big matrix equation. Okay, so it looks like this. Um, and these are my Qs. So I got Q1 all the way to Qn, and then I have one gamma at the end. Those are all my unknowns. And notice that this first equation here, right? If I just write this out, this is going to be A11 all the way down to A1n. And then I have one extra term here. That's this term here, right? That gets multiplied by the gamma, right? So when I multiply that column vector over, I get gamma times A1n plus one. That's this first row. And that's going to equal B1. And I do the same thing all the way down to Bn. So this is going to be um, An1 down to A. N, N, and then I have this last term here. Okay, so going down through all of those, those are all my flow tangency equations. And then on the bottom row, I have a cut of condition. And this is why we put these N plus ones, just to help us see where they fit into this matrix. This is uh, N plus one, comma one over to N plus one, N, and then finally N plus one, N plus one. And this is Bn plus one. Okay, so I have this matrix. It's of size n plus one by n plus one. I have my unknowns, and these are all things that I know, right? All of these a's, they just come from this expression here, uh, and b's, and then the other a's and b's come from here, right? These are all the ones for the cut condition. So those ones give me this last row, and then the first ones give me everything else. Those are all known just based on the geometry and the free stream conditions. So now I just have a linear system of equations, right? A, X equals B, right? So I can just solve that and directly figure out all my source strengths and circulation strength that satisfies my problem, right? It satisfies flow tangency and satisfies the cut of condition. So I know now the flow field around the airfoil. I could calculate velocities or pressures anywhere, but of general interest, we want the pressures on the body. Um, so we already know that the normal velocity is zero. To calculate the tangential velocity, I guess I just wrote that out, same thing here. Uh, to calculate the tangential velocity, uh, we just do the same thing, right? We take the, the free stream component, source component, vortex component, but now these are known, right? The Qs are all known, gamma's all known. So this is just something we plug in um, and we get our pressure coefficient. Remember our pressure coefficient for this incompressible rotational flow looks like this. But in our case, uh, since the velocity vector is only the tangential velocity because the normal velocity is zero, so we could say this is the tangential velocity. And I'm going to put an i here, meaning that we're going to compute this on each panel. So if I've got, here's my extremely coarse, ugly looking airfoil, I can now compute, say, the pressure coefficient on panel i, right? And do that for each panel. So now I can get forces a couple of different ways. One obvious one is I can integrate, right? I've got a pressure, so I can turn that into a pressure if I want, or I keep it non-dimensional. I multiply pressure by an area, which in this case is just the length of this panel. It's, this is force per unit width, right? And then that's going to give me some net force, which I can then get the components of in whatever coordinate system I want. So I can get normal and axial force, lift and drag, or whatever, and I just sum that across. Uh, all my panels and I can get my forces and I can get moments and things too. Um, so that's a good way to do it, but an easier way to do it would be to first of all, recognize that my drag should be zero. I won't actually get zero drag when I do um, this integration just because of numerical errors. As I refine it, have more panels that should get better, but I should have, right, that my drag is zero. This is drag per unit length. My lift I get from the cut of Joukowsky theorem more directly. That would be an easier way, right? Lift is rho v gamma. Uh, and this is capital gamma, 
right? And so capital gamma is my total circulation. And remember what I have is a, a lowercase gamma on each panel. So that's my strength per unit length, or yes, unit length. So I have to multiply it by the length of each panel. So if I take little gamma, multiply by the length of this panel, that gives me uh, the contribution to big gamma and I have to sum it up over all the panels. And so since gamma is constant, that's gonna be equal to little gamma times the path length of my airflow. That will give me big gamma. So that'd be an easier way. I just do a for loop and sum over the length of each panel, right? Li, that Li that I already have. So I add up Li for each panel, multiply by gamma, that gives me this gamma, multiply by V infinity, that's V infinity and rho. And so that's an easier way. And it can be instructive to compare both to see um, how well we're doing, but this is generally an easier and more accurate approach usually. Okay, so that's it. Uh, that's the Hess-Smith panel method. Like I said, uh, panel methods you use even in 2D are, are not much more complicated. The only difference would be is when we go do the integral, we don't necessarily assume that each thing is constant. We might have a linear variation or quadratic or some spline, uh, or we can have um, panels that aren't necessarily flat that are curved. It makes the integrals harder. Sometimes we can't do them analytically and we have to do numerical integrals, which might make it more expensive. But the principle is largely the same, right? Um, okay, so, uh, and in 3D too, uh, similar ideas, right? Same kind of thing. We distribute sources, forces. Actually in 3D, we typically use doublets rather than forces. So doublets and sources. Um, but same kind of thing, we put them over panels in 3D and then we satisfy flow tangency on all of these panels. Um, and, and perhaps some sort of kind condition if we're doing a lifting body. And, and, and that's really it, same idea. These are very powerful, very fast and useful as long as our, our, um, our application of interest is reasonably approximated by potential flow. All right, see you next time.